Heart of the Phoenix, written by Brendan J. O'Brien, read by that self-same author in a horrible accent. Chapter 1 You wake up, but it's the middle of the night. Dark, cold, absolutely still. Toasty warm in the bedroll, but you gotta piss so bad you think you might fill the Grand Canyon to overflowing. Still drowsy, you extract yourself and slide on the alligator hide boots you paid a fortune for over in Carson City. Remember to shake them out. That's good. A couple days after buying those boots, you woke a family of scorpions from their bug dreams shaking them out. Nothing tonight, though. Stretching out the crick in your back, you spot a giant stand of saguaro where you can do the deed and keep some decorum. Far enough away to be polite, but not so far you leak before your trouser snake swings free in the wind. You let out a sigh of relief as the deluge springs forth and shiver as you take in the surroundings. Almost completely flat, just scrub brush and cactus for miles in all directions. It's dark, real dark, which is why you don't see the guy who just pulled back both hammers of his shotgun. Keep your hands where I can see them, he whispers, his voice low and gravelly. You detect a hint of a Spanish accent. I would, you reply, but then I'll piss all over my new boots. Piss on your boots then, caballero. Show me your hands. You lean forward and push out your hips while raising your hands over your head. A bit precarious, this position. You're standing close enough to the saguaro to give yourself a piercing while draining last night's tea. But damn! Those boots cost a bucket load, and you're sure as hell not going to dribble all over them. A brief shadow flickers in front of the fire, but it's gone in an instant. Normally, it'd be time to give yourself a couple shakes and finish the job, but your hands are otherwise occupied. Leaning back on your heels, you see the last drop land squarely between your boots. Mission accomplished. Turn around. Slowly, senor. You sigh. Mind if I zip up first? Okay. A blast erupts from the saguaro just to your right. Blinded by the brilliant muzzle flash, your world goes dark, followed by a solid whoomp behind you. Your partner, Sandy, pokes his head up over the cactus. Think he's dead? Dunno. Can't see a damn thing. Well... Your friend there appears to be relaxing in the sand, but I believe he's missing most of the top of his head. You mind chicken? I can't hardly see the cactus no more. As Sandy walks around to check on El Bandito, you pack your trouser snake back inside your dungarees. Turning around, you can just make out the shadow of Sandy leaning over a large black lump lying on the sand. Dead? Standing over the black lump, you watch as Sandy squashes the man's hand under the heel of his boot. Nothing happens. Guess his days as El Bandito are over. Your partner nods, then kneels to go through El Bandito's pockets. You note the stray shotgun and pick it up. Cracking it open, you pull out the live shells and thank the lord El Bandito's buckshot didn't lodge in your ass. Find anything? Not much, just the bandolier. Must have a mount around here somewhere, though. That was true. Since you're leaving the bank teller of all that cash yesterday afternoon, you'd ridden well into the night, miles from anywhere. Frowning, you wonder if El Bandito followed you from town. You look up and scan the horizon for any friends he might have brought with him. Nothing moves. Sandy stands. Pointing to the ground, he says... There's tracks. I'll go have a look. Cracking open his own shotgun, he replaces the spent shell with a new one. Be careful. Sandy nods and slips away silently into the darkness. One of the horses back at Camp Wickers. Eyes adjusting back to the moonless night, you begin to take in more of the man's features. He has dark, 
weathered skin, ornamented with a scraggly beard and maybe a few weeks' growth. He's wearing simple clothes, the soles of his boots worn thin, the beginnings of a hole visible on the left one. With a sigh, you walk back to camp and throw another couple logs on the fire before sitting down on the bedroll. Your hands shake as you warm them in front of the fire. Damn, I could use some tequila about now. Calm the nerves. Out of nowhere, a clay jug with a narrow spout plonks in the sand next to you. Eyebrows raised in surprise, you look to the stars, thinking you might visit church more often. Moments later, Sandy strolls back into camp, leading a mule. Thought you might need some of that. It's good. Grow some hair on your chest. You roll your eyes as you uncork the bottle and take a whiff of its contents. Whatever is in there is strong. The fumes alone hang over worthy. Taking a sip, you sputter as the powerful liquid threatens to dissolve your throat. Gasping, you reach for the canteen lying next to your bedroll to wash it down. Sandy chuckles as he ties up the mule next to the horses. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, what the hell is that? You recap the bottle and toss it back to Sandy. No idea, he replies, catching the bottle and taking a swig himself. But I'll bet you finally got some hairs, cackles Sandy. Ignoring his jibe, you nod toward the mule. Anything? Brought him back here so as I'd have some light. Too damn dark out there to see. The mule looks pretty scrawny to you, like it hasn't been fed in some time. Hauling yourself up off the bedroll, you set the mule up with a feed bag as Sandy removes the packs and sets them down next to the fire. Returning to your bedroll, Sandy tosses you a pack to explore as he unties the other. You begin to undo the leather flap and ask, Reckon he followed us from town? Dunno. Maybe we'll find out looking through his stuff. The fire crackles and throws up brilliant orange sparks as a log settles onto the coals. You hear the mule grinding through the oats. Throwing back the flap, you squint into the bag, but it's too dark to make out anything. Coming to the same conclusion, Sandy dumps the contents of his bag onto the sand. You watch as he goes through El Bandito's meager collection. A flint, a length of rope, tinderbox, a canvas bag with just a handful of dried black beans, an empty canteen. Sandy grunts. Mm. No surprises there. He looks over at you. What's in your treasure chest, boy? Following Sandy's lead, you invert your own bag. There's a flash accompanied by a heavy thump as the fire reflects off a silver six-shooter in the sand. Lying next to it is an embroidered kerchief, a few pesos, and a folded-up piece of animal skin. Picking up the skin, you feel its age. Soft to the touch, limp from being handled. It's covering something hard. The jug sloshes as Sandy takes another swig. What you got there? Not sure. Feels old, though. Unfolding the skin, a brilliant red crystal about the size of a small apple falls into your hand. Holding it up, you're dazzled as the stone glows in the firelight showing off its blood-red hue. Sandy lets out a low whistle. Guess that really is a treasure chest. Narrowing your eyes, you hand the jewel over to Sandy and ask, What the hell is Bandito doing robbing us when he's got that? Huh. Well, he ain't got no water, almost no food, and we're deep in the desert. It'd take him two or three days to get to Boone Junction leading that mule on foot. What's a pretty rock worth when you're dying of thirst? Maybe it's cursed. Oh, don't you start again with that horse shit, snorts Sandy. Ain't no such thing. As Sandy gazes at the stone, you pick up the animal skin. Faint in the firelight, you can just make out some sort of ancient script amidst the numerous icons. There's some kind of writing on this. Here. Sandy holds out the jewel to trade. Let me have a look. Taking the skin, Sandy squints at it for a while, then whispers to himself in some language you've never heard before. That engine speak. Sandy nods. Navajo. 
What's it say? Ignoring you, Sandy continues to whisper to himself. After a few more minutes, Sandy pinches the top corners of the animal skin in his hands and holds it in front of the fire. His eyes go wide. What? What is it? Sandy lets out a low whistle. Have a look. He gestures to take the skin and hold it up just as he did. Backlit by the fire, an image appears. It's an icon of a bird drawn in the native style, spreading its wings wide as it emerges from flames below. The artwork is so obvious looking at it this way, you can hardly believe you missed it before. Wow. Gazing at the gem, Sandy mutters, I never would have believed it. Annoyed at his unwillingness to share his insight, you shout, Stop being so damn mysterious, old man. What the hell is it? Where'd you learn Injun speak anyway? My grandmama was Navajo, explained Sandy. My parents died when I was nine and she took me in. Didn't speak a word of English, Sandy smiled. I kicked and screamed, but she beat the words into me anyway. Called me Zanez, Navajo for mule. I was downright ornery as a kid. He laughs quietly, lost in the memory. You roll your eyes at the old man's sentimentality. So what does the skin say? Sandy frowns in thought. I'm not rightly sure. The writing isn't the same as I remember, but I recognize some of the words. I'm guessing it might be a legend Grandmama used to tell me as a bedtime story. The Heart of the Phoenix. Well, it's certainly well past bedtime now. Go on, tell the story. All right, but it's long. May as well get comfortable. 